Okay, sorry, last class ran late. If I can get started, please. Hello. So um, you would have got an announcement today with a couple of items on it. Your lab quiz two is up and available. Have you checked it yet or no? Nobody? Okay. So yeah. Sorry. It's locked. Right. It's got a date issue, probably. So I'll work on that, but you can still get it, right? Okay. I'm, you know, frankly, in terms of an assignment upload, I don't think it matters, but I, I'll go back and see if there's a date issue on it. Sometimes these things get locked and they don't release them on time. But if you've got it in the announcement, you can get it. You're all set. Okay. Yeah. So is that it's due November 3rd? No, that's not true. Okay. We're supposed to have three classes today. You have three submissions, and the last submission should be uh, November 7th, if I see correctly. So three says 11th. Okay. What's the date on the top of that that you see? Say the 23rd, upper left-hand side. Is there a date on the on the assignment? 23? Okay. The dates that should be there should be for this year in sequence, correct? It says 10, 30, 20, 23, 11, 15, 20, 20, 11, it shouldn't say 1123. I think that's the, I don't know what that's doing there. So I thought it said 117. So I will have to adjust that. So there are three phases. And um, let me go look at that. I, I thought it was safe to the correct updates. Let me check that. They should all be Mondays or Wednesdays of this semester. And they're roughly about a week off, you know, as we go through the stages. So, um, there is also a date that you can have for a resubmission on this. So basically that last deadline when you turn it in on the 7th, I'll go through that. I'll see if there's any outstanding issues that need to be finished up, things that maybe you didn't complete or there are some problems, and then you'll get a resubmission on it. So then you can rework those and resubmit that. And that should be ending roughly 15th of November then. We should be kind of wrapping it up before the you know, before the holiday break, so to speak, um, even with the uh, resubmission time frame. So that's the basic goal there. I'll check the dates. I, I thought they were correct when I saw that when I uploaded it, but I think the third date should have been 11-7. And if it doesn't say 11-7, what does it say? Okay. The last date, the third one. 11-23. That's the wrong one. I think the first So. I don't know how this happened, but it seems you have two different file names. Yeah. One has a V3, where 1143 is the due date, Correct. and V2, where 117 is the due date. Okay. But the one on the assignment is 117. 
The one that says V2, does it say 2022 or does it say 2021? That's the one that's wrong. Get rid of that one. That should not be right. That should not have been in there. So the dates on the V3. Let me go through that again, but that that's the. 11-7, but we'll we'll I want to make sure the other two dates are correct. So I'll go through that again. Okay. So we'll take care of that. No, that's okay. It's okay. I'll make sure that the dates are correct. The 22 file should have been turned off. I don't know why it's still showing up. I thought I unpublished it. So here's what we're working on. You're going to get a standard uh, image of a building footprint. Everybody follow me. You have it in plan and section, okay? There are no columns that are supposed to be in spaces in those locations that are open spaces and white, okay? There can be columns where there's walls. In some cases, because there's two-story spaces in there, it's going to be pretty clear where a column needs to be. Like there's a big void in the second floor. You know, you'll figure out how to frame that. Okay, the upper floor is a clear span, column free space because it's a gym. So there's no columns in the middle up there. That's the opening that's kind of like second floor to first, second floor opening. That's got to be framed out as a void. That's like a small atrium. And then the other columns can be where they need to be. But again, they can be in wall locations that you see. But for the most part, you don't want them dropping into white kind of open spaces. Okay. And it's a four-story uh, four building you know, when you figure out all the heights. In terms of how it's worked out, you have two choices, and you're either doing wind or you're doing earthquake. And there was a bizarre way in which I showed you how to figure out which category you were on. It's based on your last names. And I know the coin toss sound, sounds like it's ridiculous. But the reason is I do want to see a variety of approaches being taken here, meaning some wind and some earthquake. So if you're in that last category, it's okay. You toss the coin, you figure out which one it is. Not one, one neither of the two are more work than the other. They are essentially, a, the work level is the same. It doesn't really matter. So don't worry about that, okay? So you're going to basically have to do a, plane, a framing configuration for this project, solving gravity loads, right? As you normally do, right? And you're gonna have to be working, the next step will be working in a lateral load resistance system. And so you're going to have diaphragms that'll either be flexible or they'll be rigid or semi-rigid. You'll have to tell me what you're working with as you calculate these later on. And you're gonna have connection conditions that you'll have to describe. Some of these might be, you might have a solution that has rigid frames and you've got rigid connections between beams and columns. And you might have a system that has diagonal bracing for your stiffness and you might have shear walls. We know how to load them and calculate their drift. That's what we've done before up to date, right? So you'll be able to apply the loads to them. You're gonna to have to originate your wall loads for wind. And I know that you're gonna use that problem that was the very long problem in lecture for B, I think it was. And it looked pretty long and I know it does, but in this case, you get some real easy solutions. You don't have to do the roof because the roof is flat. Okay, so that's one thing. And you don't have to worry about that linear interpolation type issues here, that'll go away. And so you're only working with windward wall and leeward wall, that's it. You know how to do the diaphragm transference of the, the wall loads to the diaphragms. That was the first part of lecture 4A that was in their last uh, test. You have to do that all over again. You gotta push the roof, you gotta push those wall loads to the diaphragm at the roof third floor, second floor, and of course, when it goes to the ground, it dissipates at the ground, so there's nothing really there, right? So that's the next task that you'll have to go through as you're starting to figure these out. And seismic loads will be the same thing. Uh, the seismic calculations, I've told you what your zip code is so that when you go to the US GB, um, the, uh, the code site that gives you the important parameters, you can read them right off the code site for that zip code. Okay, so in California, you're in a high earthquake zone, right? In Miami, you're in a high wind load, okay? Now the wind load charts, I think yours stop at 160 that I sent to you for Miami. You can use 160, okay? You can assume it's the ASD method. You don't have to go to the limit states. You can use the 160 for Miami, okay? 
Um, the code parameters that I gave you for the earthquake are all valid. Use those and then use the zip code to figure out those parameters. Now the earthquake one will have a little bit of complexity. You're gonna use the most current form of the code. You have to do the short period earthquake and the long period earthquake. And you have to compare which one is dominant. So you're gonna have C sub S and C sub S one. Okay, you figure out which one is the larger magnitude. That's what rules the loading condition. Right? So that one's there. The wind loading is also, I know, generally complicated, but I, it's stripped out with complexity, no roofs. Um, so you're just doing walls, wall leeward, wall windward, and you're done. It's not that complicated that way. Okay, so you're working in teams again. So it's the same teams that you've worked on before. If you're a one person situation, I know what, what that means. So we'll talk about that in terms of scope. Okay, so go ahead and read through that. Um, your first task is probably to grab those images that you've got. You've got some scale bars in there and dimensioning I gave you. Just do your best to approximate what the dimensions are from what you see. Does that make sense? If one of you've got, you know, one of you say this is 30 feet and one of you say it's 29 feet, I don't care. It's, it's not a big deal. That's not the basic parameter here. So do your best to interpret it within your team. Um, you'll be first starting to develop the basic gravity load framing system that works. Um, in terms of sizing, you can see use the sizing charts that you see in the textbook or the ones that I put up to you in lectures one and two. Remember, I had some span to depth charts, various materials, steel, wood, concrete. So it's cast in place concrete, it's steel, or you can try timber if you'd like, but it's probably going to be a mass timber building if you go that route. Okay. So you're going to choose which system you're going to work with and why. Some are going to be better for wind loading and not as good for wind loading. And some are going to be better for earthquake and not as good for earthquake. So you need to think about that. So you're going to get started there um, after we get through basically laying out the building with bays and configurations for gravity loads. Then you're going to be moving to doing some of those load origination calculations. And that's going to be moving to the next phase. And then it's the final phase is going to be you're going to be having to assign those uh, loads that you have back to the, um, the vertical force resisting components that you've chosen, shear wall, diagonal brace frame, rigid frame, one of those three. And then we're going to figure out, do we have the appropriate level of drift that makes this, pro that makes this satisfactory or not satisfactory? Okay. And pretty much that's the step. You're going to run through a lot of things that we've covered in lecture four, a lot of things that we did in lecture five, depending upon what, where the earthquake or wind, and a lot of things that we're doing in lecture six and seven are going to come back at you. So this is the application of all this information. This is the end of it in the sense that it won't go beyond this for this class. And we're pretty much wrapping up our lateral force section. So as we move on to lecture eight, we're moving on to another topic, set of topics now. We're going to deal with a set of discrete topics about various framing systems. Most of these will be handled as a long span system. The easiest ones we'll start with will be ones you've probably seen before, a basic beam portal frame system or a basic truss system. Then we're going to be moving into the more complicated ones that you haven't seen before. And we'll just be working through these. These will probably take like two day lecture periods or three day lecture periods to go through this. We'll finish up with high rises at the back end of the semester. And so we'll cover a span of these different types of systems. There will be some approximation techniques. There are still some calculations you'll have to go through. They are more simplified than advanced engineering techniques, um, but they yield reasonable results, so to speak. And the math and the compl complexity is, is, is manageable. So we'll be working through that basis pretty much from now on. This next one is gonna be quite a bit of work. I'll give you that. This lab, next lab coming up is quite a bit of work compared to the first one. Um, if I need to stretch the deadlines, I can stretch deadlines. We'll look at that again as we go further. I would really like to wrap it up before Thanksgiving, if all possible. That's kind of where my target is at this point. Okay, any questions about this? Open it up, take a look at it. Don't worry, we'll get through the date situation. I'll clear that up for you. Okay. You have, oh, sorry. I intended to put some past student work samples up for you to look at, but I had not had a chance to finish that up yet. But there will be some posted for you. It will not be 
this model that you're looking at right now for this building, it will be a different one, but it will go through similar procedures. Does that make sense? You'll see the basic steps for that project. Now, why do we pick these? Um, first of all, I have to make sure that the configuration of the building satisfies the wind and the uh, earthquake codes for maximum height and volume um, and volume conditions and the shape of the volume and the geometric conditions of the volume. These buildings all, some, all um, qualify for that. You can use the uh, techniques that we've talked up to this point. They will all be valid. Secondly, usually the buildings that I have selected are always classrooms. They're classrooms for a reason. Most of the classrooms stack vertically throughout multiple floors. What does that give you? That gives you a common wall location, right? Does that make sense? What does that mean? You've got a location where you can begin to put bracing in, right? It divides the space, but it doesn't matter that it divides, it, it divides the building frame, but it doesn't divide the space because it's gonna fall into a demising wall. So you'll have walls that are continuous throughout multiple floors. That's gonna give you continuity or the stiffness of the vertical bracing, it's not gonna introduce um, non-continuity, right? It'll be easy to figure that one out. Does that make sense? So straightforward geometries, they work for the code provisions. The systems generally work for stacking elements spatially that allow you to find a location for vertical bracing for lateral loads, and it should be pretty straightforward, okay? And I will get you some updates. I'm sorry, I'll get you an update with the student past project so you can see some things. Um, it's going to require more time. I will probably have to take out more lab time and less lecture time as we go forward so we get some more face-to-face -face time going forward because of the nature of that. So my suggestion is starting today, now's the time to get together with your teammate, uh, sort out the work, right? Who's doing what, when? Um, I would say when we meet, we should both meet together so you see how this is falling out between the two of you, okay? All right, is that clear? Any questions for today on lab? All right, let's go on. Okay, so today we're gonna to take a look at basic frames for portal frames, case examples of systems, basic stability checks, loads and forces in systems, examples of standard force diagrams. What are some lateral load case, cases for single story frames? What are some of the examples of the earliest portal frame? Uh, Crystal Palace by Joseph Paxson. Somebody remember that from the history course? What was one of the other reasons it was a interesting building? Anybody remember what the reason was? What kind of systems did you study in ID3? What were they? Starts with the letter P, right? This was considered to be one of the first prefabricated building examples as well. Um, examples of them today that you still see uh, Pixar Studios by Bolin, Powell, and Jackson on the lower left and the right-hand side. You can almost see some of the similarities to the Crystal Palace. You see a lightweight steel truss-type frame supported with columns on either end, and essentially you're seeing that sort of in that building as well. So overview of steel frame portals. We'll look at different material types, steel, wood, and concrete, but basic structural form of steel portals developed um, pretty much during and after the Second World War roughly 1940s. It was a need to achieve low cost building envelopes. In cases, many cases, they were for the war effort. They were Quonset huts. That's where you know, soldiers were housed. This was a quick and easy building. It went up very fast um, on the site. Now we typically see them for uh, single story industrial structures, agricultural buildings, for example, barns and storage buildings and ags uh, uh, for, for farming. We see them are, they look basically like this. And Many of you in ID3 probably, you know, if you were working on these frames, you know what they look like. There's a primary span condition in this direction, usually the short axis, that's referred to as the bent or the primary portal. You've got infill purlins across the top for the roof and then the cladding is connected to that and the subroof. You've got horizontal purlins and that's what the wall claddings are carried to. These are a little different than wind loads. I mean, for wind load conditions, uh, rather than vertical studs that we talked about before, these are horizontal girts, so the wind loads go laterally to the columns, and that's how they get transmitted next to the next part of the system. Um, so these are sort of three generic types. Um, what's a truss system would be the left-hand side. 
Um, at the truss system, generally you connect the top node and the bottom node back to the column. And when you connect those two nodes, then you have a rigid connection at that point, which basically means the ground could be a pin connection. Um, on this case, we've got a tapered beam with a column support, basically flat, got a low slope profile steel. And then this is called a bent, meaning pin connection, rigid, what's called haunch, meaning that's the moment resisting connection for the large moment force that goes there between the beam and the column. And then you have a pin at the top. And those generally are single pieces. or can be single pieces, meaning they're shipped to the site. And these, these two L-shaped pieces sort of go up together. Um, different types of portal frames. I won't go through all of these, but there's the conventional port frame, the panel cord truss system, or maybe a pitch truss system. And you can see some examples on them. They typically are, again, use, they're pretty much kind of a long span system. You're easily going 60 feet in span with something like this for the most part, and even more than that. In some cases, for industrial applications, they have cranes and lift supports in, in, in addition to normal loading conditions. And again, exterior, this is what they tend to look like. Here's my primary bent coming down on a foundation, my purlins, my metal uh, decking, my final roofing, and on the X side, other side, horizontal elements between the vertical elements, and then the cladding is attached to that. And they typically are many times are single stories, and they would sit on a concrete slab. I won't go. These are kind of self-explanatory. These are what these sort of systems look like in terms of connections. Where do the purlins need to land? Right here. Where do the purlins need to land on the truss? Where are they landing right now? What point of the truss are they landing on? The node, correct? Why do they land on the node? Anybody remember? You guys must have talked about it in basic structures. Why do we load trusses at nodes? Anybody? Trusses are vector active. They take forces and their members take forces in tension and compression. If I don't load the truss at the node and I load that off the node, I have bending. That's why you're, or you're going to see them loaded at nodes. So that panel point spacing becomes the purlin spacing for you. And then the metal deck has to go between that. All right, examples of these steel portal frames on the left. The right. Um, we are seeing that what you see on the lower right hand side now, more or less, um, typically for out for athletic and field spaces now. This is a fabric enclosed element. Um, so we're not necessarily seeing in the case where they don't need solid roofs. We're seeing fabric, which then brings daylight into the space. And this could be basically an open cart, court for some sort of a uh, uh, athletic event. All right, so portal frame types, um, this is more or less conventional. Notice what's happening in this axis, right? We already have rigidity here, correct? We've already got our rigidity here, that's solved for in the short axis, but I have to have stiffness in the long axis. This is not uncommon, diagonal brace, diagonal brace at the two ends, and then I've got some diagonal bracing through the center. Why do they do that? Well, in most cases with wind loads, you've got loads originating here and loads originating here. So when you brace the two end bays, you stop the wind load at that point. You don't let it ripple through the rest of the frame. The other point is these columns need to be square vertically, right? They need to be perfectly plumb vertically. If you have two diagonals of equal length and these two elements have the same connection points and you attach them, you're doing what's called plumbing the frame or squaring the frame. You're making it vertical at that point. So in other words, it starts the system. It sets it up. So these are plumbing vertical, and then you can go ahead and take care of the rest of the framework. You know that's been satisfied. Um, if they don't get too far in the framing, these are the systems that probably do need some temporary bracing because they can blow over if they're not temporary braced. Uh, a more interesting example of this is a suspended portal frame. These are tall columns. They're called mast columns. And then you might have a series of diagonal or metal rods or thin cables that come down, and they land somewhere on the truss. They norm normally land at one of the horizontal members, like here and here. And then what they do is they lighten the load on the truss because those rods are picking up part of the load and they're pulling it back to the column and going down to the ground. 
Now, the column typically will have like an out, an outrigger or a kickback on this side with a counter, a counter um, rod or, or a cable going. Why? Because the column wants to pull over and the counter sort of pulls it back upward. Now, the other point of this is these columns typically have to, they're going to be subjected to some buckling at that point because of these forces. So the outrigger piece in the back and the two rods that you see here, they stop some of the buckling condition from going on in the column, so they have a function. But this is kind of called an ectoskeletal, meaning this would be, the roof would be here, and these elements are generally outside of the cladding. So frame with cross base columns, a lattice work truss with uh, trusses. Now in this case, uh, the columns are also trussed. So the truss basically carries around. That of course creates a very rigid condition here and for lateral loads for wind. And again, another version of that, lattice girded with purlins, uh, structure without purlins and roof stiffened by trapezoidal sheeting. structure with purlins throughout. In this case, I'm not sure you really, in most cases, have to X-brace every one, every single one of those bays, but this is showing an X-bracing throughout the bays. But as you see in the vertical cases, there's really only two bays in something like this that are braced. Um, the others basically do not need to be. They just simply transmit a lateral force back to the bays that are braced. In this case, with a tapered edge, you know, we, we're going to brace it here, or we can brace it with a, a frame that's more like a, a rigid connection through the lighter weight trussing in this direction. So that's providing some bracing as well. In this case, a steel rigid connection, a steel post real rigid connection here and here. And now we've got a brace frame for forces going in this direction. All right, so what do the systems look like components? They basically are the standard steel sections you see on the right. Steel beams, um, W sections, as we would call them, L sections or L sections or, T or C sections. Ls, Ts, and C sections are usually the purlins or horizontal members that are picking up cladding loads, so to speak, um, or some of the lighter roof loads. The primary sections for columns would be a very square column, like the second one on the upper right, the W section, and a pipe section or a box section, those would be columns. Uh, horizontal span beams are probably gonna be more like these. These are called like an S column or a W section, they're deeper. Um, they almost always have the main portal going in the short axis. And so again, rigid frame portal in each condition. Here we've got a series of spacing increments here. Um, how far are they spaced apart? Some people say that they're roughly one fourth to one sixth of a span. But the other consideration is, you know, you, you've got to be able to have purlins across them, and then you've got to have metal decking across them. So you have to have some awareness of how far the purlins can span at the same time. So this is a truss system for the horizontals, uh, solid columns, and then there's some diagonal bracing on the on the various endpoints for lateral stability, and um, very conventional sort of schematic sketch of these sort of lattice work systems or solid beam based base systems for here. Roof cover uh, roof covering elements basically are standing seam metal roofs. Often enough, sometimes they could be a single ply roofing. These are some of the typical dimensions starting at, it's again, like I said, about 60, 60 feet would be something, but they can go more than that. These are some approximate uh, sizing relationships here for span to depth in the various elements and the spacings. Um, you know, remember the spacing typically is also dictated by where the purlins are across the top. So how far can corrugated metal decking span? Uh, pretty easily four feet to seven feet or eight feet. I think it can go maybe up to 12, but you're starting to push the limit of its span there. So when you're looking at these panel dimensions like A, you're trying to keep them in those in those spacing increments because remember, you've got to have the purlin at the node point at the top. And again, usually you're going to connect this um, horizontal cord of the truss and the top cord back to the column so you have a rigid connection at that point. 
right? Some frame stability checks, okay? So we can do some quick frame stability checks. They're not complicated. Instability for a coplanar system, that means a system that exists only in X or only in Z uh, or Y. Summation of forces Y, summation of forces X or summation moments are not satisfied. These are coplanar, they exist in two axes only. And we're gonna only work with coplanar. We're not gonna go into three-dimensional right now. We'll do some three-dimensional things later, but not now. We'll, we'll see these, keep these in two dimensions only. Instability in a system does not mean it will collapse, but it has the potential to move or flex if what is called a mechanism is present. And basically a mechanism is something that can be rotating, rotating that causes some shift in the position of the geometry of the framing elements. So there's a formula that you can use. It's pretty quick. It says that 3M plus R represents the unknown conditions of the frame. Higher values will create increased stiffness, stability, and redundancy. 3J plus C indicates known conditions where higher values lead to increased flexibility and too much flexibility could mean instability. Where 3M plus R is equal to 3J plus C, the system is statically determinate if no conditions of external instability exist, we'll talk about those. When 3M plus R is less than 3J plus C, the system would be unstable. It's got a flex point. It's got a mechanism present. It's not stable. When 3M plus R is greater than 3J plus C, the system is statically indeterminate or redundant, meaning it's stable or very likely to be stable, but it's not able to be solved for. You might not be able to apply basic statics to solve it. J is the number of joints in the frame. R is the number of reactions that are possible at the supports. That means the grounded condition. M is the number of members in the frame. A change in the angle of a member indicates a joint. So when there's a change in angle, now you have two members, one on the left, one on the right, so to speak. C represents degree of restraint lost by adding the connection at the member. By default, all connections are considered rigid. So you have rotational restraint, vertical restraint, and horizontal restraint. When I introduce a type of a joint, like a pin connection in place of a rigid, I would have N minus one, meaning three in this case, minus one, and uh, my C value would be two, okay? I'm sorry, C value would be one. What does the one represent for C? It means you lost one degree of restraint. So if I have a rigid connection and I make a pin connection, what happens, right? Now the element can rotate. Everybody follow me? I've lost rotational restraint. The so number one means I know I now lost that rotational restraint condition. I introduced flexibility, in other words. If I put a roller um, um, in the system, I might even go to two, meaning I lost two degrees of restraint. I lost a lateral restraint and a rotational restraint. Uh, three is a constant, represents the conditions of restraint. So back here, when you see 3M and 3J, it's the con conditions of restraint at every rigid joint by default. The C is when we start introducing flexibility, meaning we're taking away the rigid connections. So if you take a look at the left-hand side, we have 3M plus R less than or equal to or greater than 3J plus C. How many members are there? There's three. One, two, and three. Reactions, how many reactions of two pin connections on the ground? There's two, right? There's two lateral and vertical restraint, total is four. J is four, how many joints do you see? One, two, three, four, each of the four corners. C is one. I introduced a pin in the middle of that horizontal member at that point, and now I've introduced a degree of restraint that's lost. If I run the numbers, I get 13 is equal to 13. That essentially means system is stable and determinate, uh, providing there's no flexibility introduced, but should be stable and determinate. And I'll give you a little hint why it would be. Um, there's a pin connection here. There's a pin connection here and a pin connection here, right? If I draw a line between those three, what form do you see? You see triangle, you see triangulation. Trusses are stable because they have triangulated joints, right? So when I connect three pin connections and I see a triangle, essentially what you're saying is I have stability. Does that make sense? 
I, I know some of this is not hard to use your intuition at times. It's not exactly, it's not always ever. So on the right-hand side, I've got the same condition, except now I changed two things, right? I made pin connection on the left and I made a pin connection on the right and I added a diagonal, right? Okay, so now M is equal to four because I've got the diagonal. R is still four, two pin connections at J3, J4. Uh, J is equal to four, why? Pin connection on the left, um, two members come together, um, and I've got C is equal to one. But on the right-hand side, I have three members coming together. And so three minus one is two. So C is two. On the left-hand side, two minus one leaves me with one. C is one. Running the numbers, I've got... 16 greater than five, 15. The system is stable and it's indeterminate to the first degree. Does that make sense? I've got one degree of redundancy, right? It has essentially more and more restraining condition than needed. Is redundancy a bad thing? Is it like, oh, I've got surplus strength and I don't need it? No. Why would you want redundancy? What if something goes wrong? Do you say, oh, that's too bad, the building collapsed? No. Okay. How much redundancy is too much? Um, most would say three is probably reasonable. Um, if you're flying an airplane, I'll give you an example. Um, what happens when they something goes wrong and they can't move one of the rudders of the ailerons? Right? First switch they flick didn't work. They have a second electronic switch they're going to flip. What's the third thing? If the electronic systems are dead, they've got a mechanical crank somewhere. And they're going to crank that physically as a mechanical crank. So they've ruled out we can't steer this plane through electrics any electronics anymore. I have a mechanical override. So why is that important? You have three degrees of redundancy. What's the consequence of an airplane accident? Everyone dies, right? So you have to have adequate numbers of redundancy. Of course, you don't want to go to that catastrophic condition. Or likelihood everybody dies. All right, um, I, won't, uh, I won't go through the sample problem. I'll, rather than do it in class, I'll just show you the answers. Um, in this case, um, here we are. We've got the two diagonal braces in here and we're running the numbers. M is five, C is four, J is four, R is four. We get 19 greater than 16. Now we've got additional levels of redundancy. Um, you know, we've got level redundancies of, of of three. So some people would say, you know, what is the analogy to a, a monolithic shear wall? Now we don't have a formula to show you a monolithic shear wall into this. It doesn't work that way. But when you think about it, this condition is not far off from the shear wall because what is the failure condition in the shear wall, right? A crack pattern, correct? We've seen it before, right? We've got the cracks running through both, both directionalities and that tends to be our pattern of failure. So in a sense, this is not a bad representation, perhaps, of the stability condition that gets presented by a shear wall. Level redundancy three. All right, let's take a look at the system on the left and the system on the right. And I'm not gonna make you solve them. I'll solve them along with you here. Three, me three members on the left-hand side, the two verticals and the horizontal, the joints are four. A pin connection, a connection on the left. What's on the right-hand side? What's that connection on the right, on the ground? Sorry? Roller or rocker. And at the top, we have two rigid connections. Everybody see it? Okay. Um, reactions on the ground are three, right? I only have one reaction on the right, right? And I have two reactions on the left, correct? C is one again. Center horizontal member gets a pin inserted. C goes to one. I run my numbers, I get 12 less than 13. What's the problem? If I push down on this node right here with a force, what happens to this frame? What's moving? What's moving in this frame? If I push down on the top of this, anybody? Tell me what's gonna move. Matt, tell me what's going on. Right side's going to kick out. Everybody follow me? You're going to get like this, right? 
this one won't, but this one does, right? Because it's not restrained. So that's your that's your instability condition. That's what's moving. Let's take a look at the right hand side. 3m plus r less than greater than or equal to 3j plus c. Um, m is equal to 11. There are nine joints, three rows of three. I got seven reactions. I have a rigid connection on the left, and then I got two pins. And there's a lot of C's in here. Every one of those C joints is going to generate a value. And uh, the two members coming together, they'll generate C as one. Three members coming together, they'll generate C as two. But then I got this one here, right? One, two, three, four, five, right? Five minus one, I got C four, okay? We got a lot of C's in here. And I run my number, I get 40 greater than 35. I got three levels of redundancy. That's pretty good, right? Um, if you took, let's suppose you said, no, I, I don't want that much redundancy. I want to reduce something. Is there anything you could change here, like either adding a pin connection or removing a member that you could introduce a little more flexibility, let's say one degree flexibility, but still have stability? Is anything available to you, do you think? What do you think you could do to change that? So I'll ask a quick question. Could I put a pin here? I'm getting some head shakes. No, why? What happens if I put a left a force here in the lateral direction and I put a pin here? What happens to this frame? It's gonna rack, right? I got all pin connections. There's no triangulation in the upper bay. Everything's gonna rack. It's gonna fall over. Uh, the only one I could think of possibly here might be to introduce a pin here. Maybe I could do that. I haven't run the numbers, but that might be able to be possible. Why? Well, I've got a diagonal brace over here, right? And I've got a rigid connection up here. That may be enough. My point is getting a little bit of facility with this means you can understand when you can change or modify something. You can add stiffness where you need to, or you can back off. So kind of understanding what are the possible changes is useful. Um, examples of these in other cases in red uh, steel buildings, this is the Renault headquarters by Norman Foster. This is the example of a mass column coming down. And then these are the horizontal, these are cat, uh, cellular beams or castellated beams that are used. It's a really interesting system. The rod that comes down here goes underneath here, connects back to these two vertical chocks and then it comes back up again. And that actually does a unique condition. It adds to the moment of inertia and stiffness for that horizontal member. And it stiffens that, that element for the, the vertical gravity loads. So interesting system. It's got a lot of sophistication. Uh, this was basically meant to be creating a single module that could be both office and warehousing functions. The argument was that the companies like this, they don't know how much office space they need and they don't know how much warehouse space they need. So they have to have a space that can go either direction, flexibility to go either direction. So they created one module to do it. Um, they thought because it was a high degree of replication, it would be economical because they just keep creating these bays and modules. But unfortunately, because there's a lot of custom elements in it introduced, these are not standard elements, they custom fabricated. They found that uh, economic, uh, cost effectiveness that they thought was going to be there was not. Um, we don't see a lot of arch traditional architects using these things, but we have some examples of them that are pretty rare. Um, if you're from the western part of the state, this is the Herman Miller Design Yard. I can't remember where it's at, somewhere out far west there, um, in the far uh, western edge. And it's by Meyer Shearer and Rockcastle, 1988-1989. These elements are basically standard steel prefabricated portal freight buildings. The white piece here and the two silos, which are kind of like salt silos or something. And why did they use this? They said because it was a rural area, they wanted to connect with the imagery of uh, agricultural buildings in the area. And so they, they chose to adapt that. Um, typical spans here, 30 to 200. I would say we don't see a lot of 30. I think these are starting probably closer to 50 to 60 for the most part. And the span to depth ratios are approximately something like this. And again, they're typical spacing apart, as we said earlier, L over four, L over six is a typical spacing increment. 
Um, could you make these out of wood or glue lamb? Yes. And so here's a wood or glue lamb portal frame. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side, the two variant forms of this. Um, these are uh, large blue elements, and you can see the span conditions, uh, 10 to 20 meters curved beams. Again, that's in the um, 30 to 60 feet range, and you can see some of these are going up to 50 meters, meaning um, possibly up to 150 feet with uh, the portal frame with curved haunches. Uh, case examples, them in real buildings. Um, there are three or four right here. Uh, this is a warehouse design studio in Germany. Um, religious structures here, another warehouse down below in Germany, okay. and um, an educational facility on the lower right-hand side here. All of these are using portal frame conditions with glue lamb elements. <laughs> and some more. Australia distribution center basically means it's sort of a warehouse. Uh, as you can see here, a series of large, large manufacturing or warehouse type spaces. That's pretty common. And this is another project, more of an office building down below. And an international exhibition that was developed in um, two, two, the year 2000 um, in Hanover, Germany. This was the, the, the German pavilion that you see on the right hand side. All of these are basically timber portal frames, glue lamb portals. Uh, a sports hall in Kobe, Japan, uh, really long span, um, as you can see, slightly curving upside down curvilinear uh, uh, glue lambs because they get deeper at the mid span because you know the moment force is larger there. So you've got a deeper section, the moment of inertia goes up and you've got the large timber columns on either end. More interesting project. Some of you probably saw this from ID3. It's a school building in Italy from 2016. These enormous, they look like mass timber portal frames that have been carved and cut out of the wood as panels, creating these kind of inferior, interesting interior shapes. And they're basically a whole series of these things that are all stacked up with a pretty close spacing, as you can see here. Um, on the um, Illustration here, this is a tennis hall competition. I don't know if this was built, but it was a competition for a tennis hall in Sweden in 2009. And it is a portal frame, but it is somewhat of a two-way directional grid to a degree. But these are these pl large sort of plywood elements that you see across the top being proposed. Or again, the portal frame is primarily in this direction. Then you have these sort of Y columns on this side. So you have two points of support for it. Concrete portal frames are possible. I would tell you I don't see many of them, um, but they're generally precast systems. So you can see a precast uh, sort of typical portal frame, shed, shed frame on the upper left. Um, a half portal frame, sorry, like a half portal frame, sort of the L-shaped form on the right for a grandstand. Another uh, sort of warehouse type portal frame. And you could even probably, I mean, I haven't seen people build with these, but, you know, these kind of... Uh, spanning elements that are used largely for culverts and water and things like that are spanning across a bridge, you know, creating a bridge across a, a, ro a roadway. These these are essentially portal frames as well. Can't say you can use them in, a, in an architecture building, but they're typically more bridge spans. Uh, steel portal frame case example. This is an enormous, it's a biotechnology research lab center in South America, huge, portal frames here, and then huge trusses to support the walls at each level here. And you can see a section through the interior. Sometimes lab spaces are given a lot of flexibility because they change the configuration of labs over time. And so a column-free kind of universal space was developed so that they could move, move their spaces around. An example here. Uh, some of you have seen the Apple Store. Um, can you? Is there such thing as structural glass? Yes. And these are structural glass portal frames. You can see in yellow what I highlighted in yellow are the portal frames in both directions and directions, axes and directions. Uh, project in Germany, it's more elegant steel portal frame. This is a flexible office space. 
So there are two, two modules of this large portal frame in steel. And then there's sort of like an adjoining sort of circulation hallway in the bottom, the small bay. And again, these are designed as sort of universal space, free span open spaces, because offices now can be moved in different configurations and locations of office spaces on the floor. They want that for flexibility. It's, oh, it has a huge amount of glass. I have no idea how the thermal energy performance of this would work, unless this is all really high-performing glazing. Uh, Moore's Otmer is a, a combination of a warehouse plus office spaces. And this is in, the, I believe it's in the, in, um, I believe it's in the Netherlands. And so you're looking at this point, this is the office space on the end, which is here. And this portion to the backside with the vertical flatting basically is the warehouse. And so, you know, diagrammatically, it looks like this, a series of pin connected columns throughout and office section here, warehouse section here. And it is a lattice portal in the short axis, the red that you see here. And because it's connected across the top, it, it has a river connection. If you notice here, the office space has these little column bays, right? These are usually not normal for steel buildings. They're like, you know, 13, 15 feet. Uh, those are called drop-in mezzanine systems. And what happens basically, again, an owner of a warehouse office space sometimes doesn't know, know how much warehouse space they need and how much office space they need. Uh, warehouses have a very thick um, uh, ground grade floor. Why? Because they've got really heavy loads. Pallets and things are there. So what they're allowed to do is to take a lightweight tubular steel frame column and lightweight, typically uh, cold form steel elements for trusses uh, uh, or girders, so to speak, or beams. And they create this very light steel framework and they don't need to have a, a footing below that column. It basically sits on the very thick slab and essentially it's safe and it's anchored back at the bottom and it's anchored at the top. And so it's a drop-in mezzanine basically means you build it inside the building. It doesn't have to respond to lateral loads. And essentially it creates the volume of space you need for offices. And you can also, it's all demountable. Meaning you take all the parts and pieces apart and you can recycle them or move them elsewhere. Uh, this is a system that was a pilot project. It was developed by well-known British architect, Mike, Michael Hopkins back in the 1980s. It was a system that they, I guess, patented or developed called the Patera system. Uh, these are what are called industrial units, nursery industrial units, meaning these were meant for small incubator companies that would start up, and they would come in and move into that space, and they could lease that space up. So as you can see on the left-hand side here, you've got a steel lally column, steel tubular column, then you've got a truss across there. It's an ectoskeletal portal frame, essentially, lattice truss. And then the wall panels and roof panels are essentially hung underneath it. And it creates a large free span space. It's got an interesting feature. Uh, in order to shift to the site, these long trusses, you have to have them in pieces. So there's a welded joint here and here and a welded joint here and here, but you notice there's a pin connection here. So they can take it apart, move it to the site, but they still preserve a rigid connection at that point. In the center, there's an interesting connection. It's this one. This basically is allowing a little bit of flexibility in the system when necessary, but it doesn't create instability. And so literally there's sort of like a pin connection at the midpoint there of this. Um, again, famous architects doing these projects with steel portal frames, Norman Foster, Modern Art Glass Museum on the upper left, uh, a speculative office building on the right, and down below, where essentially Foster is using a standard on the left-hand side, a standard portal frame and trying to work out the solution architecturally within that constraint. Um, this is by Kengo Kuma. It's called Under One Roof. It's an enormous long linear art pavilion outdoors. And it's one enormous portal frame, as you can see here. And it is a varying geometry and configuration. So they literally have to create multiple versions of the portal frame. They have to respond to all those dimensional shifts. So there's a high degree of kind of like digital fabrication and ways in which they handle the geometry and the configuration complexity of the geometry by creating all these mortal, portal frame variants in profile. Looks something like this. Um, ranch house. Um, 
trying to think where this is. Uh, I think it's in Australia, um, but an existing metal shed building that existed was left in place, stripped up of all the, of the uh, walls. And then the architect built the uh, new house underneath it. And in this case, why would you do this? Well, it's a hot, arid climate, parts of Australia like this, desert areas. So you literally put your building underneath an enormous shading canopy. And you recycle the building. Essentially, that's a recycled shed. It never moved off site. Sharon Fieldhouse, uh, Virginia, by Design Build Lab. Uh, this is a series of, as you see, steel, uh, steel portal frames. It is a kit of parts approach. You might have thought about that term in ID3, where you have a limited number of elements that you use to essentially build the entire building. It's got a small kit of parts. A communication center by uh, in Kansas. Uh, again, here's your primary portals right here, cantilever portal and a single span portal here. They do the overhang in large margin because they want to get some shading. Uh, exterior portal frames for this project in Dan and Denmark. It's meant, it's irregular form with these sort of diagonally braced column conditions are replicating the forest is their an analogy. So they wanted to create something that represented, repl replicated the forest in the background. Uh, high school, gymnasium in um, Africa. Enormous steel portal frames being used for this gym floor. All right, um, take a look at our portal frame weight to span comparison. When do weights start going down when we have long span capabilities? Well, if you look to the left-hand side, whether it's a solid portal frame steel element or a lattice portal frame element here, we've got a little bit of variation here, some variation in the weights relative to span condition at 15 meters. But the further farther it goes to the right-hand side, when we get to 40 meters, you notice the gap starts to change. In other words, more efficiency, less weight is kicking in relative to the efficiency of the system. I won't go through all of this, but there are some advantages and disadvantages to portal frames. That is to say, a truss frame, lattice framework versus a solid rigid steel beam framework. And these are some of the advantages and disadvantages. What happens when portal frames go bad? Uh, this is the Kemper Arena in Kansas City, designed by a famous architect from Chicago, Helmut Jan, in 1973. No, it's not supposed to have a big hole in the roof. Um, the steel portal frames are these three elements here. They're enormous steel truss portal frames. They span this huge, this huge open uh, sort of convention center space. And then on the bottom here would be where steel joists, uh, sorry, large steel beams or trusses would be connected across. They would deposit their reactions at the node points in the truss, and then there's uh, purlins or secondary elements, and then there's final roofing is on top of that. So there's a bit of irony here. The structure collapsed in 1979. It was hours after, after the annual American Institute of Architects convention. And no one was collapsed. The building, thankfully, was empty at that point. But here's what it looked like. The collapse occurred after a period of heavy rains and winds. It was its cause is attributed to a blockage of an internal roof drain. In other words, architects, you know, they didn't push the water to the outer edge and let it drain off. In some cases, they, you know, they'll pull the water inward and then they'll have an internal downspout in the building, and then that's how the water goes down. But there was some sagging in the internal regions of the building, so what's called ponding effect takes over. In other words. The roof is can't draining, but it's starting to sag downward and water, more water is piling up on top of it. The more water increases the load and more sagging is going on. And eventually we have the failure. And the failure was said to originate in high tension bolts connecting the roof to the trusses. Do you see these little stem pieces right here? Those little stem pieces were then going to pick up those uh, trusses that were, you know, elements that were spanning between those large portal frames. And you can see one of them here, but they said it was a failure of the bolt connection. Something basically sheared at that point failed. Now you can see the example of this. We talked about what happens with failures in long span buildings. 
And one of the problems with them is large scale collapse, right? You have very few number of bays because you've got such a large span. And here's the example of that. You know, you have a large scale collapse, a lot of failure conditions are manifest here. It's not localized. I, I won't go through this, but there's a video link here on the lower left. And if you click on it to look at it, it will actually show you this construction sequence of how all the pieces and parts go together. Let's take a look at frame behavior. So on the upper left-hand side, this is a rigid portal frame, rigid connections at the ground and rigid at the top column connection. If we put a uniform load on it, what happens to it? Well, let's go down. The deflection is the middle ray, bay. What happens on the very bottom? Well, that's our moment dive. And so everybody see what's happening here? We've got a lot of, of moment force going through this corner, right? We talked about the haunch supports that we typically see in portal frames. That's the reason you've got the haunch support there. The thickness has got to take that moment resistance. Um, we also have a bending force moment here. It's at it's 0.22 kip feet. And then we've got some forces going through the columns and there's some rotational strains at the columns. Let's see what happens when we change this. Everything is the same in this condition, but what happened on the ground? I took off the rigid connections and I made them pin only. So now the grounds cannot have a rotational restraint because it can't restrain it. So it's only got lateral thrust and vertical loads. Where does the moment force go that was over here? The moment force that was down here has to go upward, right? There's no other choice. It's got to go upward to the rigid connection above that. Now, the variance in the beam uh, moment force isn't much. I'm at 21 kip feet here. I was at 22 kip feet there. Primary force condition shift is going to occur in the columns. Notice in both cases, what happens on the ground? The portal frame kicks outward. It wants to deflect it and push outward to the ground. Now I'm gonna introduce some changes in, in asymmetrical conditions um, as I go through this. So now I've got a rigid portal frame base and a uh, rigid portal frame base but pinned at the top. What happens now? Well, I'm gonna get a larger moment force at the middle, right? Mid span of this. This was 0 0.2, 0 0.22 and 0.21 kip feet in the last example. I don't have any moment absorption here or moment absorption here for the beam because I have a pin connection. What happened to the moment force in the beam? It doubles. We're at 0.4. So here's the point. You have a choice here. Either you're going to take some of your forces by rigidity of connections, and if you don't have high degree of rigidity of connections, those rigid connections go away, the member has to make up the difference. The member has to work harder. Irregularity. Um, I'm going to leave a rigid restraint on the ground here, but I'm going to create a pin connection here. Notice the frame is no longer symmetrical in deflection. Things are starting to shift to the left. All right. Remember, stiffness attracts load. I've got larger force going on here and rotational restraint here. And I've got less on this side, more stiffness here, more of the load is moving in that direction. Architects and engineers generally know that if I want to move a force or load a force condition away from one part of the system, I can change stiffness and I can move it where I where I'd want it. Form efficiency. Can you create form efficient structures? This is a, a project by um, Robert Millard. It's a warehouse structure in, in 1924. It's cast in place, sorry, it's cast concrete and it's in Switzerland. And if you take a look at the shape, um, basically I'm overlaying a moment diagram. Everybody see the moment diagram in green at the top? So that would be a uniformly loaded roof condition and there's a column column and there's two overhangs on either side. So what do I notice? I have a large reaction here, large moment force here. I've got a fairly deep part of the section here. At this point, I've got also a deep section. I don't have much strength, much depth over here. Why? My moment force went to zero. I don't have much of a stiff need for stiffness at that section, so this section is not very deep. Um, I do have some larger moment forces in here, right? But you notice there's this weird thing that the bracket arm comes in and I go to zero, right? Everybody follow me? So in theory, that point where I go to cross the origin and I have zero moment, 
could be that point right there where the two Y connection column pieces come up and I have a pin connection at that joint. So my, my point is that it is possible if you understand, let's say a dominant load condition like moments, you understand the shape and profile and shift and magnitudes, a form efficient structure is one that adapts to that. It creates depth or stiffness where it needs to, it reduces depth and removes remove stiffness where it doesn't need to for bending forces. Here's two examples of that. So on the upper left-hand side, rigid connection uh, on the ground, rigid connection at the top, uniform load. What could I do? Well, I could put a mass column in place. I could have um, to pick up some of this moment force going on over here. I could have an outrigger over here and I could have a rod coming down from this point. That's gonna give me some more depth there for that moment force. And I'm gonna stiffen the column with the outrigger and I'll stiffen the beam with the vertical extension of the column. At this point, I go to zero moment, right? I don't need much depth in the beam. I could let the rod come down, go to a very small depth in the beam condition, introduce this kind of inverted bowstring truss, and I have the depth that I need, right, to counteract that 22 kip foot moment with some additional depth in the inverted truss. And then I switch back over to the rod on this side. Now on the ground, I have some moment forces here, so I could stiffen the column maybe with a couple of rods here and stiffen this condition on the, on the ground for a bit of a moment force. On the right-hand side, a simpler, ver the other side, sorry, down below is another version of the same thing. Except in this case, um, I don't have tension rods anymore. Everything's gonna have to be a solid element. So like a hollow tube section. And I could change the shape to be form efficient like the one above, but I'll, I'll just use rod, uh, sorry, hollow tubular sections to do it in steel. Here's our basic moment diagram for simply supported beam pin connected to the top. I'm at 40 kip feet. I have two solutions, a bowstring truss, Basically, it replicates the shape of the moment diagram. The truss gets deeper where the moment force gets larger. The truss gets shallower when the moment force goes to zero. And the mid condition is this one. I just have the same shape, but I invert it. I turn it upside down. So moment forces in portal frames. Some examples of moment forces on the right-hand side. In this case, um, this is a solid, rigid mortal, portal frame. It's a lattice work and then pin connected on the ground and a somewhat similar variant for, form of that here. Other moment resistant portal frames, again, moment diagrams on the right-hand side and sort of their companion example on the left-hand side to increase stiffness where it's needed and reduce stiffness where it's not. What happens in cantilevering? Well, you're gonna have some really large bending forces here. So <laughs> these are examples of three really large cantilever buildings. I think all of, them, all of these actually happen to be a, uh, like a large airline servicing center for maintenance on a large commercial aircraft. So in other words, the airplane comes in here. You notice there's no columns here. So the airplane can come in the building, come under the shed, and then they pull it out and it's removed outside. But these are all large cantilever conditions with rods and cables allowing for that enormous overhang. You know, 40 meters, for example, cantilevers that can literally sort of, in this case, enclose an aircraft, a large commercial aircraft. Other effects of cantilevering here. If I have this built, if I have this typical beam simply supported on either end, my M, my value for maximum moment is M. If I have a one-third extension cantilever and overhang and one-third on that side, I go down to 0.17 M. That's like one slightly less than a fifth of the original moment. So when people have told you cantilevers or overhangs reduce moment forces, yeah, they do. They can do a lot of work to reduce them. This would be a one uh, a cantilever overhang only on one side. I'm still getting a benefit. I'm reducing the maximum moment by about a third, or sorry, two thirds, 0.23 m. 
Some of you may have seen a bridge that looks like this in the lower right, fifth to fourth bridge in Scotland. The moment diagram, um, sorry, the cor correlation to moment diagram is up above. And again, you see the notion of the point of inflection, zero moment point here. So we've got a pin connection here. We have a smaller moment, 0.33 M, but these huge stanchion supports at the ends here and here, they're picking up that large uh, 0.67 moment force on either end, and therefore the truss work has to be much deeper. And then the moment diagram goes to zero at the end, so these elements narrow out and they have you know small thickness at the end for that reason. Here is the effect of overhang on this project. On the left-hand side, there's an overhang condition. Now remember, if we didn't have the overhang and we moved the columns out here and out here to the right, we had a 0.22 hip foot moment force in the middle of that horizontal member, that beam at the top. Now look what it's at, 0.12. So by introducing the overhang, I've cut it, almost cut it back in half again. All right, let's take a look at approximate analysis of lateral loads by chordal heights. So one approach to this is taking what are called degrees of indeterminacy. If we have four reactions at the ground, we have three equations of equilibrium, we're going to have a degree of redundancy, redundancy or number value one. But if we introduce some strategic points to indicate introduced connection conditions of pins, we can now move to being a system that can be stable, but also be determinate. So the DOSI of a portal frame um, in the various very various versions that I showed you a moment ago is from one, three, two, and one, based on the type of frame. If we utilize a simplified technique, we would take the following into consideration. And then this, remember, this assumes that there is relative stiffness, meaning the beam is not sufficiently significantly stiffer than the column, and the column's not significantly stiffer or weaker than the beam. We can consider horizontal support reactions are equal. So just a, taken as a given. There's a point inflection at the center of the unsupported height of each fixed column base. We know this from the portal method of analysis. There's a point of inflection at the mid height of the column. We can assume the same here. Horizontal body force is not applied at the top of column, can be divided into two forces applied at the top and bottom of the column based on simple support reactions. For hinge and fixed supports, horizontal reactions for fixed supports can be assumed to be four times the horizontal reaction for a hinge support base. So let's take a look here. Upper left-hand side, we've got a 10 kip force from left to right at B. We have nodes or connection points are A, B, C, and D. It's 15 feet apart and it's 10 feet tall. So for this frame, we'd have three times three, plus four minus three, minus three times four, or we have one for degree of indeterminacy. But we can simplify that and make that determinate if we say that the horizontal force at D and the horizontal force at A are not unknown, the assumption will be given relative stiffness that they both can be taken as equal. So we have 10 kips at B to the pushing to the right. We're gonna have five kips pushing to the left at A. We have five kips pushing to the left at D. Summation of moments at A suggests that we've got 10 times 10, 10 feet times 10 kips minus VD at 15 feet is zero. Vertical reaction at D will be 6.67 kips upward. What would be the vertical reaction at A? We agree that this force pushes on this side. It would pull the column out of the ground, correct? and it would push the column into the ground on the right-hand side. So here's gonna push up 6.7 kips here. What has to happen at A vertically? What has to happen at A vertically? Does reaction go down or up? Down, what's its magnitude? What's the magnitude? If it's 6.67 up on the right, what's the magnitude on the left? 6.67 down, equal but opposite. So here's our reactions, five, five, six, seven, six, seven. Rotational equilibrium is satisfied. Translational equilibrium x-axis is satisfied, five and five is opposite 10. 
vertical equilibrium is satisfied, six, seven up and six, seven, six point six seven down is equal but opposite. Axial force diagrams, what do they look like? If I draw the axial load here, I'm going to have 6.67 kips, right? What do I know that I have here? Right? I've got a tension force in that column, 6.67, right? It's going to extend all the way up through the column to this point. And what's going to be my, my force here in compression? Well, I've got a five kip reaction here and a five kip reaction here. What's going to be the force in the middle? Five kips, right? Notice the signage. This is kind of reversed some of the conventions. Tension here is positive. Compression across the top is negative. What's happening on the right-hand side? Well, you said we're pushing the column into the ground. Yes, it's in compression. Magnitude 6.67 kips. So the axial diagram shows 6.67 negative. My shear forces, what are the shear forces in the column? Well, I got a five kip reaction here. So five kips all the way up. And what's going on across the top? Well, I've got the 6.67 here and the 6.67 here vertical reactions translated up from the bottom. So I get a shear force negative 6.67 here. And I've got a shear force here, negative five. What's my bending moment diagram? Well, I have a pin connection at the ground, so bending moments have to go to what? Zero, is that correct? What's the moment force at the top of this column? Well, I have a 10 kip force at uh, 10 feet, but I also have the five foot force acting in. So really I've got a five kip force here at 10 feet. So I've got 50 kip feet. And on this case, I've got a 50 kip foot reaction here, 50 kip foot reaction equal but opposite on the other side. And if I added a moment, a pin connection at this point, could I do that without affecting stability? Could I do that? I could, right? That was the problem we solved earlier today. I said, what if I put a pin connection in the middle, right? And we solved that problem. Yeah, if that's the point of inflection, given the load condition, I can insert the pin and I don't have an instability problem. So let's take a look at portal frames with rigid connections. We're going to say H sub D and H sub A horizontal are equal. So 10 divided by 2 is 5 kips. And in this case, we're going to be having some additional forces going on because we've got a rotational force going on at the ground. And so our, our 5 kips times 10 feet is what on this side? It's a rigid connection now. So I now I've got a 25 kip force foot resistance here, and I've got a 25 kip foot resistance here. 25 is counterclockwise. The other 25 is counterclockwise. It's both totaling 50. And that's opposing the 10 kip force times, or five kip force times 10 feet again, because they're five on each column. And that's the clockwise rotation. Now, what we talked about earlier is you're going to see a reduction in my gravity loads. And so the net result is because these counter opposing moments are in place, my reactions at the end are going to go down. The moment is doing part of the work that now the axial forces and the compression and tension of the columns don't have to do the work. And so as a result of that, figuring out my vertical reactions, I'm down to 3, 3.33 on either side. Again, there's still tension on the left and compression on the right. And essentially simplifying this with the new values, I wind up with these values here. And in theory, could I introduce a pin connection at some points? Yes. In addition to putting a pin at the midpoint of the beam, I now think of what else I could do. I could put a pin point at the midpoint of the column, right? Remember the portal method of analysis, right? What did we say? You could take a beam point apart with a pin connection at the midpoint, and we said columns could have points of inflection and or, or pins connected at midpoint of column height, and they can be. And this is just a larger working example of that where you're actually solving these equations and you've disconnected the frame in these calculations here. So I, I won't go through that, but you'll, you'll see these values are gonna fall into play just like the last slide. All right, in the case of indeterminate portal frames, there are typically standard published values for some. Uh, these are some 
um, that you can see here for uniform loads across the top. What are shear moment and axial loads? If there's a, 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 a pin force on the left-hand side, let's say for wind or earthquake, shear moment and axial, simple bent frame with a roller on one side, you can see the values here. And a simple bent frame from the lateral force, you can see the values here. Getting more complicated here, um, a three pin portal frame with a pin connection on the right beam and column and two pin connections on the ground. These are your standard values and, and descriptions for axial and shear and moment forces. And again, what's noticing what's going on here, when I introduce flexibility here, the left-hand side, since it has rigidity, has to carry a larger moment because the force is moving towards that stiffness. And a three hinge portal with a pin connection at the midpoint, gravity load, here are my moment shear axial diagrams, and with a concentrated force on the left, my shear moment and axial diagrams. So these are standard values. Uh, with two hinge portals or rigid portals, indeterminacy gets higher level, it's more difficult. And so here are some of these same values for shear moment and axial, and they're expressed in terms of uh, percent values relative to M and H and W. So all you have to know would be uh, the dimensions, for example, and the load supplied, and you could calculate these values, but the diagram, the diagramming will look something like this. So these are standard in a sense what are called pre-solved values and a fully rigid portal down below. And this one follows the portal method of analysis pretty close, you know, for lateral loads that you did for homework recently. So what do some of these frames look like? Rigid connections all around. See the bend and roll behavior. You can see the push out going on in the ends. Lateral load force across the top. And you can see the drift condition that's described here on the left, left, left hand side. Um, I won't really go through this, but it's an example of calculating used on that standard formula that I just showed you a moment ago. Pin connected portal with a single pin at the mid span. It breaks it all down. It's the same basic example problem all over again here. Here we have a hinge, hinge at beam column um, intersection, hinge at mid span condition. And these are solving for some of the values that are associated with this for gravity loads. Reactions. Let's take a look at this one. And I think we should be, I just want to find out how far we are at the end. Um, I'm not sure we'll finish up today, but we might be able to finish up today. All right, so here's a single portal frame in a multiple bay, one story building. Purlins are simply supported beams spanning on the 35 foot bay. Each load is split 50% to each portal. And the tributary width per portal, for example, would be 35 feet divided by two. Um, plus 35 feet divided by two. So we'd have a 35 foot tributary width associated with the two center portal frames. My dead load is 25 PSF. My live load is 30 PSF. My wind load is 20 PSF. So my total loads coming together here, um, um, dead load plus live load. W gives me 1.933 kip feet, converting the uh, uh, values into kips here. The vertical studs of the wind load to the roof diaphragm would be split in half at 15 feet. Half of the, uh, 50, uh, the 15 feet divided by two times the 35 feet width times 0 0.002. And remember that's my 20 PSF expressed as kips, gives me a five kip, 5.25 kip concentrated force right here acting on this center portal here, or it would be the same as this center portal here. M max based on gravity loads, 0 0.08 WL squared. That was the standard formula I referenced earlier here for these type of systems. We get 
246 foot kips. The moment diagram that you see on the right hand side is shown. The M max at the end, 0 0.045 times 5WL squared, gives me a smaller moment at 138.96 kip feet, roughly half the mid span moment. N is a constant axial force going through the beam, with H is the height, total moment at the end. And so the N value for that value, the reaction, constant axial compression would be 0 0.045 WL squared over H, or the 138.96 kip feet divided by 15 feet. That was my column height. And I get 9.26 kips coming down. My wind load is pH over two, 5.25 kips times 15 feet divided by two. My wind force moment condition is 39.38 kip feet. And as a constant axial force in the beam as a result of the wind load pushing to the right and the 5.26 kips divided by two, um, because this load is going to be split between uh, two columns, one on either side, I get 2.63 kips. Column on this side's tension, column on this side's compression. So column range values for gravity. I already have the moment I calculated that earlier. Gravity reactions from the beam above 138.96 foot kips. And a constant axial compression force in the column, I'll have the 40 feet divided by two times 1.93. It gives me 38.6 kips. From my wind load, I've got an already calculated 39.38 foot kips. N is the constant axial force in the column as a result. That number gives me 1.97 kips. The beam design, the gravity design will control, not lateral force. The gravity load assessment for the beam, mid span 246 moment, end support 138 moment, my axial force from the end support condition 9.26 kips. The maximum moment is controlled by the gravity and the beam at 246 foot kips. And is 9.26 foot kips. M at the ends due to the gravity load plus uh, 138.96 foot kips, the wind 39.38 foot kips. I'm going to add the two moments together. I get 178 foot kips. Axial load minus compression, gravity plus wind. I'll have the axial force total 9.26 plus the 2.63. I'm at 11.89 kips. When the gravity and the wind loads come together, remember we talked about load combination force effects. This is an example of the force effects of gravity plus wind. The beam and bending is controlled by the maximum moment from gravity. S would be section modulus required would be M over FB. Uh, it's A36 steel, so F, capital FB is 24 KSI for the bending stress. You gotta convert the units into inches for S. The section modulus required for the beam would be 123.2 inches cubed. My beam evaluation, okay, if I check a W24 by 68, SX is 154, RX is the radius of gyration in the x-axis, 9.55, cross-sectional area is 20.1. There's going to be a slenderness ratio check. The joist spacing is 9.5 feet on center. They laterally brace the beam at all at 9.5 feet approximately. Um, the section is treated as compact. It's a frame that's not going to be allowed to translate. K is one for stiffness. We're at 40 feet 12 for unit conversion times 12 inches per feet divided by 9.5 feet on center. And I get 50.26. Any value for slenderness ratio under 200 is acceptable. If again, you have the charts from either basic structures or intermediate structures that show you the slenderness ratio check for steel columns and compression, a value of 51 for slenderness ratio means my allowable compression stuff in the steel would be 18.26 kips. And I have what's called the interaction formula. Actual compression stress, axial, divided by allowable axial stress and allowable axial stress compression plus bending stress actual divided by bending stress allowable combine those two together they have to be one 
less than one. If they exceed one, the system fails. So the first part, 11.89 for axial divided by the 20.1 over the 18.23, I get 0 0.03. For the second part, that's the bending force over here. I wind up plugging the numbers in, I get 0 0.8. My 0 0.8 plus 0 0.03 gives me 0.83. And my interaction formula tells me I'm only using 83% of the capacity and stress. So therefore, I've got a margin of about 17% safe. Of these two values here, this one is bending, this one is axial. Which one is contributing the largest percentage to the stress condition? One's 80%, one's 3%. Which one's doing the work? Which one's contributing the most? Bending, right? So do I need to, what I, if it was unsafe, would I need to add increase to the cross-sectional area? No but I probably would need to make it deeper or wider because I'm going to have to get more bending resistance in it. But I'm okay at 80%. And here's sort of the diagram going through from up above. So gravity column, gravity values here. I'll just finish this up. Um, M at the ends, again, the 138.96. Axial compression, 38.6. Wind load, 38, 38, 39.38 foot kips. Our axial compression force, 1.97. Gravity plus wind, that would be the column on the right-hand side, 138.96 plus the 38. My maximum moment's now 177. My N axial load total would be the 38.6 plus 1.96 wind plus um, gravity. I'm at 40.57 kips. My column restraint at the ends only. My section modulus needed there would be 96.78 as a result. My column would look like this on the right-hand side. Reaction from gravity up above, reaction from wind to the left, total moment transmitted across the top, reaction from the wind to the right at the top. Now the ground connection has to have the reaction below. My allowable, my column, let's say this size has these values. My slenderness ratio, again, 59.6 or rounded up to 60. I have allowable compression stress in the column, 17.43. I'm going to do the interaction check, compression plus bending once again. Same numbers from up above. I get 0 0.107. I get 0 0.863 for bending. Now I'm at 0 0.97. I'm still okay. Most of the work is the problem, most of the force problem is coming still from bending, but I'm getting a little bit more coming out of the axial loads from the gravity as well. All right, I'll stop there for today. Um, let me see what I can do for homework for you. All right, I would like you to look at these problems. One, two, three, and four. Do your checks for stability. And you could do 9.2 and 9.6. These are all restated in um, uh, your Canvas homework assignment. You'll find them all there. So you can do these, you can do these homeworks. Um, there is a bonus homework there. I think that's also on Canvas. Um, do I have a sign-in sheet somewhere? Yeah, All right. Yeah. Um, I've heard a couple of different things. So I just want to get it from you. Um, the test 